All right, guys, this is a High Middle Ages AP World Review Part 2 while we're in the coronavirus lockdown. And I apologize for yesterday. I had a meeting to get to, so it was super rushed, so I don't know how clear I was. So we are going to back up a little bit today, and we're going we're gonna to go over this. Um, we're going to get to the point right where Pope Urban II is hoping to heal the great schism between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox or Byzantine Christian Church. Um, the great schism had happened in 1054 over a dispute in the Holy Trinity. Roman Catholicism, there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three parts of one whole. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, it is the Father and the Son are one, but the Holy Spirit is something else different. That is the big obstacle. Then there are things on like what type of bread you should use for a communion. Can priests get married? Can you have statues to um, different saints? All of these things divide the churches. And then the Crusades happen. And Pope Urban wants to get the warring knights the heck out of Europe to give the peasants a break. And it is the first crusade that is literally the only successful one. And the key point about it is, is it reignites cultural diffusion. It reconnects, and you'll see a map here in a second, um, Western Europe to the rest of, of the world. And the difficult part here about these reviews is we have to review pretty much you know, 700 years of world history for one speaking question. So if I'm giving you too many details, just kind of um, let me know here. There are eight crusades in all. The first and the third are the most popular. The first is big time because it is successful. The third one is the great battle between Sir Richard the Lionheart and Saladin, and it's also the birth of the great Robin Hood story, but it completely fails. You have all these crusading, crusading knights going down there, and the first one works because of the armor, the heavy armor, the chain mail, and the weapons that the knights had. The Islamic warriors are going to modify their technology and be able to win the next several rounds. So here is the route over land of the first crusade. And then later on they get smart and they begin going by water where it's much shorter. Um, but um, they are um, unsuccessful. And what I was talking about yesterday is this is where the brave peasants become long distance traders. They've, you know, at the bottom of the social class. They're going to be poor and they're going to die young. So why not take the risk, go down to the Holy Land or Constantinople and get these goods like salt, like pepper, like the mystical spice. It was a spice at the time known as sugar or silk or cumin or cinnamon or paprika or whatever it was. Bring it back and make a lot of money. Now, instead of just going back to the, their Lord's Manor, they went to small villages and towns. And to do this, they are able to generate a new income with cash money. This will allow the king to no longer have to use nobles to run his government, and it brings an end to classic feudalism. The government where it's a, 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 a king depends upon you know, subordinates to be loyal and manage his land and maintain a standing army for him. Also in these towns, coming back is the reawakening of, of education, the mystical skills of reading and writing, as people were going to churches to learn how to read and write. Well, now universities are going to be created, and a papal decree will say that anybody who goes to a cathedral school must be taught for free. Education comes back to Europe, a literate um, bureaucracy. So the big thing about the Crusades is they increased European demand from luxury goods from Asia. We are going to have the Silk Road is going to be connected right through here. And tomorrow we're going to talk about the Mongols. And you've got to think forever. There was the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Over here, 
all right? Well, you had the um, you know, Sassanid Empire and the Mughal Empire and the Gupta Empire and the great Han Dynasty. So traveling across the Silk Road had been safe. After these you know, four great empires had collapsed, there were barbarians. But Genghis Khan is going to come in. So we're going to get a Mediterranean route the overland Silk Road route, and eventually the Indian Ocean, shipping goods from Western Europe. Remember, stone soup that had been closed off for 600 years are now reintegrated. It's the Italian trading states that are going to move a lot of cargo to meet the demand for new trade in Europe. So now we get these specialized artisans. Like the example I use, like this blacksmith here, are now going to be able to ply their trade in a new town. The, the king will allow people like blacksmiths, like butchers, like bakers, like candlestick makers to do their job in their town. The money they make, they are going to pay to the king in taxes. But they have a freedom of choice of when they are going to work. They begin to form guilds like the blacksmith, all right, where there is only so many blacksmiths allowed in this town, where they will guarantee the quality and the price of an item to make sure there is enough work for all four of them. The king is getting more powerful. He is getting more money, allowing him to do away with his nobles. So in old school feudalism, the king will give land and a title like count or duke or lord to a noble who must provide soldiers, all right, a, a, an army for the king. He must provide land and legal protection to the, the um, peasants, and the peasants must do all the work. They supplied the lord with everything from the food he eats to the clothes he wears, and they give him rent or taxes in agricultural products or in their job. This guy works for the king in a castle and is supposed to be subservient to the king. But after a while, this guy forgets who gave him the castle. Maybe his grandpa was a friend of the king, but I haven't seen the king in a long time, so he becomes disloyal. Now kings can give charters and privileges to a town who have the artisans and the people who will do a job. They will generate enough money for the king to hire his own soldiers. He gives them their paycheck. They can't survive without him. So the town, the money allows the king to hire soldiers, and they serve him. These guys, he doesn't know if he can depend on. So he eliminates them. It makes it more efficient, and strong kings are about to come online. But society keeps its old framework, all right? The, the nobles are on top. Then you've got the religious clergy and the peasants. It's like the Estates General we saw in France at the time of the Revolution. The nobles are the highest class, all right, from large landowners to small time guys, all right? The only way you could add to um, your wealth was by being a soldier, attacking something else, conquering it, um, you know, raiding other, you know, um, peasants. Um, and so boredom um, was not fun. That's why there was all this fighting going on in Europe all of the time. But we also, as a result, develop a code of conduct known as chivalry, the way a lord, a knight, is supposed to act. There were rules, and if you broke them, there were penalties. It was very similar to the Japanese samurai code of Bushido, except the worst thing a knight could do was to be cast out, have his, um, his knight knighthood stripped from him, where in Japan they had to commit um, seppuku. So um, here um, we have the um, clergy. Now this was the only class that was open, so to speak. You could start out as a peasant, and make your way to be a bishop or a cardinal or an archbishop, um, if you could. Your rank was based on your religious training and how you carried yourself. Now, a lot of these went to the second and third sons of, of nobles. 
because their oldest brother got all the land and the title. They could either be a soldier or go to work for the church. And the church was pretty safe as the upper levels will live off the labor of the um, peasants. Um, you know, they rented out church lands, they, they collected church taxes, and these are the problems that Pro Gregory and the Cluny monks tried to fix. But the church in the high Middle Ages remains important. All right? Remember, it's separate from the government. But life was still hard, so they were to find a way to help you get to heaven. But many high-ranking members of the clergy will abuse this power, causing anger by the peasants and um, the serfs. And here is the third and largest class. These guys, unfortunately, have to do the work for um, everybody else. Serfs and peasants were like slaves. They were considered property. They could be jailed. They could be executed. They could be bought and sold um, uh, at will. And so this we probably won't need to know, but we're going to go over it anyway. There were two types of, of manners. The first one is a servant or a servile manner. This is where you have people who have no skills who just do the grunt labor. All right? They've got no privileges, no rights. They've got to do whatever the Lord of the manor says when he says to do it. A free manner is where you have people who are highly skilled, they're artisans, or they have land, and they will trade their, their talent or their land in order for um, protection. Since they are bringing something to the table, they have a few more rights and privileges than those on this type of manner. But a town is something different. They would say, um, if you live in a town for one year and a day, you have a breath of freedom. You don't worry about a lord except the um, king. So we still have the Pope and the Church on top. We got our individual kings, his nobles, the knights, merchants, farmers, all right, and craftspeople, and at the bottom are always the um, peasants. So here is um, uh, Sorbonne University, the University of, of Paris, and this is the cathedral. There was a school in my favorite town in England, um, one of my favorite towns called Salisbury, not too far from Stonehenge, the highest steeple in Europe, but it's leaning over. And in the back of it right here is what we're going to talk about next. It is an original copy of the Magna Carta. Now, we talked about William the Conqueror yesterday in a very quick, hurriedly fashion. He goes to England as a French duke. That's going to come into play. A vassal to the French king now is the king of England. Here in Ivy Bridge with his um, Doomsday Book. And as king of, of England, um, he takes those things like the, the, the legal writs we talked about yesterday and the idea of parlaying, and he brings the census to, to England. And England is prospering and becoming powerful, and that's going to bring in this book taken, a uh, uh, top secret photograph that we had to do some shenanigans to get, one of the originals of the Magna Carta written in 1215. And what we have is this lady named Eleanor of, of Aquitaine. Now, she winds up um, marrying the French king. She was a French girl. Her dad was one of the most richest, powerful men in France, southwestern France, in, in Aquitaine. And the French king is a philanderer. He cheats on her, is not very nice to her, so he has their marriage annulled, saying that Eleanor um, you know, was unfaithful to him, um, infidelity. Well, this makes Eleanor and her very wealthy dad very angry. Well, Eleanor, just a few weeks after having her marriage annulled from the French king, gets married to the English king, Henry. And Henry, all of a sudden, gets more and more and more and more oppressive at home. But as a wedding gift, Eleanor's dad gives King Henry of England a bunch of land in France. England and France can't stand each other. Now the English king owns rich, powerful land in France. And the French said, wait a minute, William the Conqueror was a vassal to the French king, 
So the king of England really works for the French. That doesn't go over well, and as a result, Eleanor of Aquitaine is going to be the unwilling like spark to the Hundred Years' War between England and France. Her court, as she gets divorced from Henry, um, is famous for creating the idea of courtly love or forbidden love from afar, such as the love triangle between King Arthur, his queen Guinevere, and Sir Lancelot. It comes from scholars um, at her court. And so, after William, we get King, King Henry, who increasingly becomes more and more and more harsh to his um, people. And as a result, they don't like him. And the next guy to talk about is King Richard the, the Lionheart, the famous fighter who will lead the Third Crusade. He is going to leave behind his brother, Prince John. And Prince John is told, look man, just keep the seat warm, just don't do anything until I get back. Well, with Richard away in the Holy Land, John decides to take over. And he makes the Pope angry by when the Archbishop of Canterbury dies, John tries to name one of his buddies to the post, the highest ranking church official in England. And the Pope is like, John, look stupid, you can't do that. That's lay investiture, what we talked about um, yesterday. And John says, I'm going to do it anyway. And the Pope is a guy you don't want to mess with at this time. So he excommunicates John. And John's like, I don't care, I'll do what I want. So the Pope places England under what's called interdict the heaviest piece of ammunition a pope has. That means all the churches throughout England are closed. Nobody can go to church. Daily mass, baptism, confession, marriage, last rites, none of that can happen. The people are at a feverish pitch. And John, also at this time, had started a war with the French. The people were already paying taxes to the Richard's War in the Holy Land. Now they've got to pay more. Well, he loses a war with um, the French. And he has to make concessions to the Pope and the people as they're beginning to rebel. They literally chase John down, they knock him down, and they force him to sign the Magna Carta, or the Great Charter. So, um, you know, here is the moron. Um, uh, um, himself, um, Prince John. This is going to be Pope Innocent III, who we're going to talk about. And here is um, Richard the Lionheart, the famous knight of the Third Crusade. Well, Pope Innocent III is probably the only guy that can rival Urban um, II. And the Magna Carta will change the landscape of things forever. What it does is it creates English common law where all of the sudden everyone is now equal. Right? There is common law in England and it places the English king underneath the veil of English law. Before this, the king was above the law. He could do whatever he wanted. It didn't apply to him. And now English law all right, is in effect for the monarch. The monarch is subject to the law. No longer can he do whatever he wants. So while the English king is losing power over in France, as we know with Louis XIV eventually, the French king will emerge as a dominant leading figure. But this is going to set up a clash between the Pope Innocent III and different um, emperors. Innocent III will at the same time excommunicate John in England, King Philip of France, Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, and another guy named Otto. Several of them tried to subjugate um, the, the Pope. There is a civil war going on in the Holy Roman Empire with England backing one side and France backing um, uh, another. And while all this fighting is going on, it is the 360 independent princes of Germany that are the big victor. Pope Innocent III will beat down John several times, I think Philip of France four times, Frederick Barbarossa twice, Otto twice. He lays the hammer to everybody, and Innocent III emerges victorious. So as we're getting ready to move into the Renaissance, 
the most powerful thing in Europe, the continuity here, is still the church. The big changes are going to be the reintegrating of Europe into the international trade scene, the creation of new towns, and the destruction of feudalism. All right? The big winners are the 360 princes of Germany. But there's still some things to talk about. The Hundred Years' War will be fought on and on for over a 120 year period between France and England from 1337 to 1453. And I told you about Eleanor of, of Aquitaine, and they're fighting over this land. And it was fought primarily, besides the British and, and French antagonism, as a growing economic rivalry between England and France to get money, for their king to have money and get rid of his nobles. And there's this renewed sense of nationalism. <laughs> oh, I am France, oh, baguette. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 creme brulee, croissant, you know, bread as hot as a baseball bat. <laughs> and then, boom, mm -hmm. what division and chips are you talking about? God save the queen, you know, drive on the wrong side of the road and all that. You know, oh, in very old England, you know, teaspoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down and all that. They just simply don't like each other. And the British are going to win many early victories, the most famous one at, at Agincourt, due to the new invention of the British longbow that could shoot about 400 yards. So the English are winning um, in France even though they are um, outnumbered. And the French are going to rally behind a small 17-year-old young girl from Joan of Arc over the Maid of, of Lorraine. Now she is going to have a vision in church. She goes to the French king and says, hey, I've had a vision, I'm, I know how to do this. And the people rally um, behind her. Um, somehow, she is the difference on the battlefield, but she is accused of, of witchcraft, so she will be burned at the stake in 1431. But her rallying the troops pushes the British back, and coming over from the Ottoman Empire in China is the idea of the cannon. At first, they, they shot like stone like, you know, round bowling balls. They weren't metal or explosives. And the French cannons will defeat the British. And so the big important thing here is to be um, the effects they have in England and France. As both of them are moving forward, they begin to take different developmental paths. How they are going to, especially the monarchies, are going to be um, different. In France, the kings will greatly expand their power in, in their influence, where in England, they are continually subject to the power of parliament to get money. And so, but England is not so much worried about all the fighting going on in the continent. They're going to look to expand. Here is young um, Joan of Arc and some scenes from the Hundred Years' War. Um, they are going to look to colonies and land overseas. Instead of trying to create an empire on the continent, they will go elsewhere. And it's at this time that both countries, England and France, realize that the heavily armed clinking, clanking, clunking knight um, is outdated. It's not a small number of highly skilled soldiers. It's numbers. Who can put the biggest army on the battlefield. Who can transport that army from A to B the fastest? It becomes a numbers game instead of a small number of highly trained warriors. So, with the end of the High Middle Ages, near 1300, Europe is going to come out of the Dark Ages. We are going to get the building of modern nations like England and, and France. Worldwide trade from the Mediterranean to Eastern Europe, to the Middle East and China is going to be reawakened. Cultural diffusion, education, technology, mathematics, craftsmanship is going to um, come back. Education is going to blossom once again. And the Pope is still strong enough to stop kings. There is still a separation of church and state. 
Um, and so we're going to begin building these cute little towns with a castle on a hill and the town beneath it, bustling and growing. Towns are going to begin to expand and become modern, modern stone, modern wood with highly skilled professions. Printers, blacksmith, you know, artisans, teachers, professors, all this is going to come about. And it's great as, as we're headed into the um, Renaissance, what we'll talk about, oh, maybe tomorrow or next week, is the Mongols and Great Pax Mongolica, the empire of Genghis Khan. They are beginning to move out of China. They are moving westward and getting very, very, very close to Europe. This is going to be a good thing. It's even one branch. The Golden Horde goes up into um, Russia. They re um, reopen this great Silk Road trade route. But unfortunately, they bring the Black Death. And so, with the expansion of trade between this, we're going to have a couple new problems. Number one, because of education, the Pope is going to lose power. Number two, the nobles are going to be weakened in many areas. As kings increase their power, their nobles lose it. And because of the Black Plague, where not only is the Pope going to lose power, but it's going to increase anger, bitter, and resentment between the peoples of the book and scripture, Jews, Muslims, and Christians. And so here we have the different crusade trade routes that I showed you um, earlier. All right, Kingdom of the Fatimids, we got the Seljuk Turks down here, we've got Greek Orthodox, and we've got Western Europe. Well, when the Crusades began, the power of the church was nearly at its um, high point. It was dominant. But by the end of the Crusades, things had gotten bad and church power due to some corruption, corruption is decreasing. So for a couple hundred years, from the 12th to the 15th centuries, we see a, a, you know, a commonality of not only a decline in feudalism, but a decline in the power of the church because of disease, a series of wars, and political changes. So, um, one of them is going to be the Black Plague, and I feel weird talking about this during coronavirus reviews, but it's part of history, we have to do it. Whether it's the Black Plague, the Great Plague, Black Death, Pestilence, you name it, it reoccurs several times. It's not a one-time thing, but the one that starts it is here in the mid-1300s, 1346 to 1351. The plague even got some people in Yosemite National Park um, a few years ago. And the Black Death is an epidemic that starts when the Mongols start to conquer across Central Asia, and they get over here to the Crimean Peninsula. Now, Genghis Khan is going to split his army between his different um, grandsons. And so we're not exactly sure at what point on this conquest it, it, it came from, but we know that it's going to travel the Silk Road. And it's going to be on the, the, the fleas of rats who are going to infect people and when Wen Khan kicks the people out of the city here in the Crimean Peninsula, they're going to go to Constantinople, and then over to Athens, and then over to Italy, and it's going to spread like layers of cake across North Africa and Europe, but also across um, Asia. And so um, we think of it only in Europe, but it actually kills 25 million people in China and across Central um, Asia. And the symptoms of the plague, you know, very, you get this very painful kind of egg-sized swelling, this bubble um, on you. It will turn like deep purple or black. You're going to have a high fever. You're going to have the chills. You're going to be throwing up. You're going to be um, delirious. And then within three to seven days, a person with the plague is going to unfortunately die. Some people were immune and some people weren't. So we know the plague is going to come in from over here, the Crimean Peninsula, 
via Constantinople, as the people fled the plague, they unknowingly brought it with them, and it moves steadily northward. Um, by the time we're done, a third of the people in Europe are going to die. Those that lived were, for some reason, a little healthier, a, a little stronger, natural um, immunity, and it recurs all the way up until the 19th century. So it hangs around for about 500 years. And one of the things that allowed the plague to spread so badly was the filthy living conditions where people only bathed once or twice a year. They thought bathing would spread sickness. They went to the bathroom in chamber pots and just threw it out their window. They didn't have a latrine or a septic system. You know, animals lived inside. There was garbage. There was trash. It was just gross. And so streets were just full of just disease and, 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 and bacteria. And so nobody was safe from this. Men, women, children, rich, poor. Um, it really um, it doesn't matter. So healthy people, all right, talk about social distancing, avoided the sick. They didn't try and take care of them like our doctors and, and nurses. They just um, avoided them. Parents abandoned their children. Brothers abandoned brothers. Uncles, their, their nephews. You can see this is from a thing known as the, the, the um, Decameron by um, Basio. They said people just fled. Fathers, mothers, their, their own children. Doctors would refuse to, to see patients. It was just nasty. So a lot of people have to find an explanation. Some people said it was God's punishment, so they confessed and began to beat themselves um, with whips. Some said that it was an alignment of the planets. It was cosmic. Some said it was by lepers. Um, many people said, oh, it's got to be the, the Hebrews. It's got to be those guys. They, they poisoned the wells, so there's more Jewish um, persecution at this time. These are some of the crazy, stupid things people came up with. Don't eat poultry or waterfowl or pork or beef. Fish should eat. Don't exercise too much. Nothing should be cooked in rainwater and olive oil is deadly. And my favorite, bathing is dangerous. The Medical Faculty of Paris, 1348. Um, so what you should do is just think good thoughts, like your Peter Pan, all right? Um, don't think of death. Don't think of stress. Everything you think about should be pleasing and agreeable and about delicious things, beautiful gardens, great smells. Listen to good songs. If you do that and think of gold and silver, you will just be fine and the plague won't bother you. None of that nonsense works. Um, no one could figure out how um, to cure it. So they had plague doctors in like a hazmat suit with like this big beak kind of, you know, glass, kind of like welding goggles and a stick to beat people out of the way, thick leather gloves, gloves, and like a raincoat. They would go in and see if you were sick or if you were dead, and then they would um, take you away. Um, doctors tried bleeding, um, lancing the um, boobles, using different herbs, taking baths in rose water or vinegar, but nothing really helped. And so as these townships are growing, um, they kill, um, because people are in close quarters, about a third of Europe's um, population. Trade declines and prices for products increase because they were hard um, to get. And at this time, nobles begin to hammer their peasants who wanted higher wages for their work so they could avoid these products, causing many many peasant um, um, results, revolts. So all over Europe, unfortunately, Jews were driven from their homes. Some were massacred. When the prayers of the priests didn't fix it, um, the church suffered a loss of um, prestige, and more people began to put money into research, science, and medicine. So that is the end of the High Middle Ages from Europe. Um, we're going to do the Tang and Song Dynasty next real fast.